Hey guys, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great stream with a returning guest, one of everybody's favorite. I think you're really going to enjoy. Morgoth, thanks for coming on, man. Nice to have you on again. Last time we did Spengler, it was great. Um, this is a, a hopefully we can pick up where we left off. Yeah, anytime I want to talk about Spengler, I want to talk to Morgoth because he has excellent videos on it. He's very well versed on it. We've had conversations about it previously, and so... Uh, when I wanted to go ahead and talk about the next book from uh, Spangler, he was definitely the guy I wanted to go to. So the the book we're looking at today is Man and Technics. And Spangler is interesting because his best known book and probably, of course, his most important book is also a giant tome. It's a, it's a thousand page, pages, right? The Climb of the West is, is huge, it's dense, it's very complicated. And so a lot of people who might otherwise be interested in Spangler are a little intimidated to just kind of pick up a thousand pages, uh, you know, over two books and just dive deep in, especially when the, like, the second chapter is nothing but math. So uh, I guess the first thing I want to ask you, Morgoth, is what about men and techniques? Where does this fit in uh, Spangler's kind of canon? Yeah, thankfully, Spengler tells us himself at the little a little forward that he's written to the book, and it's he, he seems to be frustrated because the, because decline was so huge and it kind of meandered over all kinds of culture and architecture and and art and music and um, that he I think he was kind of like thinking like wait a minute, there's I've got some feedback from decline and people don't get it. You don't you don't get the real black pill. So I'm he's condensed it all here to uh into man and techniques. And I think people think it's it's actually just about sort of man being eaten up by his machine and Western man in particular. Uh, but by techniques, he means something a little bit more than that. Um it's actually it's actually a, 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 a a way of living it's a techniques ends up being a way of um well we can we can get into all of that i guess um but that's that's kind of where i would kick off with it well then let's yeah let's just go ahead and and start out then what does he mean by techniques what's that definition or what what is that it's, process for him so in in the beginning of the book he he makes a lot of uh, analogies with the what with the natural world with um herbivores and predators and he's saying that man is a predator and if you think which is what he uses um a, a lion chasing a gazelle like the actual tools that he has that he's using are his teeth and his claws and his legs, his ability to cheer, or the lionesses, to be more accurate, I suppose. But the the so then you've got the tools. But what he's what the the techniques is actually the strategy. So he says the techniques is the tactics of all life. Uh, a, cha a, a lion chasing a gazelle is one, or a shark preying upon a fish. Um, the the way they do is is the techniques. It's just it's just the it isn't just the the, the machine or the tools. It's more like a mode of being, and this seems kind of a bit out there and a bit like you know wh where what does this have to do with sort of what we expect from Spangler and machines, um, and then he 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 moves on, and he spends quite a bit of time. Um, set it, what he's doing is setting up the the, the, the real basics of his worldview um, with this. So the 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 lion exists in such a way that he has a, a, a tactic of life. He has a mode of, of actually existing in the world, which is automatic to him, beyond just having claws or big teeth. It is in the nature of the lion. It's his technique. His techniques is to chase gazelles um, and then he goes on and says that man man is a beast of prey and when you um to push it along a little bit he also brings in man himself and then he, he splits it in two and i think this is very important because it's he talks about the eye and the eye represents vision and then you will get the, the visionary and the, the the eye is the man the is, is the man of truth basically so the man of truth is looking for the causality of things mainly looking in the past but this is also where you will find the priest you'll find the shaman you'll find the philosopher um and there's the unspiritualism the deeper questions 
or represented by the man of the eye. Um, and then you get the man of the hand, which is the fact man. And so when to move on to like what we were saying earlier about the lion, this now comes back into play. And you, so if you think the hand and the hand holds an ax uh, or, or a, a saw or something like that, um, and then you can begin to see, well, that's the tool. What then is the technique of, of, of the man of the hand? And um, that is actually, whereas the, 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 the techniques, if you could even call it that, of, of the visionary man, the religious man, w would be spiritualism. It would be the quest for a metaphysical truth, for example, or truth. Mm. The, the man of the hand, and a, a good way to, to sort of think of it, is that if you have an axe and you've got a log, um, it's easier to chop the log uh, downwards, going with the grain, rather than crossways where you're going against the grain. And this is a basic kind of introduction to, to the techniques that he's going to talk about in terms of man, and then he's going to be more specific when it comes to the Western Faustian man. Um, that What you're doing is, if you if you have a, a, a piece of a log, and then you stand it on its end, and you bring the, the axe down from above, you, you go with the grain, that's the most efficient way to uh, chop up your, your firewood or whatever, over going crossways. So the technique is then not just the tool and not just the way of the tool, but there's something else higher guiding it, which in this case would be a uh, drive towards e efficiency and making things easier. So we get at the very most basic level um, a kind of introduction into the use of technology and the, what it actually is, what the actual technique is, is to make things easier. Uh, for even at the like, this is the most basic level, but he's going to expand upon that uh, quite a bit. There's a third bit that I would um, sort of where, where you can bring in the <clears throat> the more Faustian aspect to this is the, the use of the word uh, weird. And I had to ask one of the pagan bros how you actually said that, because mm -hmm. the ancient Anglo-Saxon um, word, there's a, there's a recurring theme when, you, when we're talking about the Faustian civilization in the earliest pot-like stages, in this embryonic form, you, Spengler usually paints a, a sort of, mystical uh, scenario of, of the men of the north of Vikings sort of roaming around under empty skies and um, across Vikings on their boats. And he actually lists out at great length, like how far and how early the Vikings discovered places as far away as uh, Morocco and, and um, Ukraine. Um, and so the, the word uh, weird is interesting when you see where this is going because it's a, it's a concept in Anglo-Saxon culture uh, roughly corresponding to fate or personal destiny. And the same word, uh, so it's a very ancient uh, Nordic word, and the same word weird, which eventually we would know as weird today, but it also has very something very similar in um, Dutch, in the Nordic languages, in German, in all of the what he would regard as the Faustian uh, civilizations, the, which what would become, and in actual fact, the, the 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 real meaning of it is to become, and it it connotes fate or personal destiny, and so we have here in the earlier stages quite a sort sort of like a primordial brew, from which something unique in all of world history is going to come. So if we have uh, the 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 other civilizations, I did a video on them. It's like an hour long on my YouTube channel, and I've got a podcast of it on Substack where I actually explore a little bit the the other, like a brief guide to the other civilizations, who all have their own prime symbol uh, and sort of metaphysical impulse. Um, and what you'll find, whether it's the Greeks uh, or the the, the Magians or the Chinese. They they are sort of contained, and mostly they they would their destiny is in the hands of the gods, 
and they are mainly, especially in the, the Greek and Roman civilization, they are kind of like the playthings of the gods. And so it's important when you, the, the 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 weird concept, um, which is and and the sort of the the to become and the the open destiny of the Faustian North, because it means they're unbound. Their their their, their destiny is open um, to, to infinity, the, and this is eventually going to matter. <laughs> it's going to matter a lot when when you begin to bring in the technic side of it. Because the the, the the driving technique is, it's always been a little bit unhinged. And the gist of the, the technique in the book on man and techniques is that the hand, which is to say the pragmatism and just doing things for the sake of it, is then unbound also. And so it, it slips the noose of, and Spengler's view would is the grand tragedy uh, of... of um, of the the visionary man, of the spiritual man, and like in the primordial symbol, like in we had the 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 destiny is open to do which he will dictate himself, and the general arc of the book is that he this is exactly what's happened that Western civilization has slipped the leash and gone rogue entirely, like against nature uh, in toto on Earth. So uh, that's where I would sort of kick off with. <laughs> Yeah, pl plenty there. So there, you know, no no lack of things to to kind of chase that down. I guess let's go ahead and move a little bit because you talked about this, the you know, the the hand in the eye, the the uh, the two different uh, techniques, the kind of men and and what would be controlled there. One of the main focuses there, as you said, is once kind of the Fausty man slips the the leash of the metaphysical. The one of the things that Spengler talks about in kind of that chapter is the focus on the utilitarian and and uh, you uh, before we got started, you were making some really good points uh, kind of along those lines. Can you talk a little bit about that process of, of yeah, why I've actually, I've actually got uh, a bit to read. Yeah, just why not? Excellent. It's in the beginning of the book. Um, so this is the I've got it marked out here. I'll read the uh, particularly I, I, I like there's a lot of good stuff in here, but sometimes you just get these like lovely little uh, Spenglerisms in his writing, and this one's got one. And it's he says utility meant what was conducive to the happiness of the majority, and this happiness consisted of leisure. You can see he's kind of got the usual disdain for the, the mass man that like you'll find yeah. in so, so many of the people. This is in the final analysis, the doctrine of ben, Jeremy Bentham, Mill and Spencer. The aim of mankind was held to consist in relieving the individual of as much work uh, as possible and putting the burden on the machine. Freedom from, in quotes, misery of wage slavery, equality in amusements and comforts, and enjoyment of art, again, in, in kind of mocking quotes. Thus do the, the bread and circuses of the cosmopolitan cities of the late periods announce themselves. The progressive Philistine became excited over every button that set an apparatus in motion for the supposed sparing of human labor. In the place of the authentic religion of earlier times came a shallow enthusiasm for, in quotes, achievements of humanity by which nothing more was meant than progress in tech in the techniques of labor saving and amusement making of the soul not one word was discussed so you can see he he's really critical of a sort of the materialism which the, the machine age uh, seems to be bringing forward and, and in this as well he makes another good point it, it sort of you can see also the, the sort of knife in the heart of Marxist thinking as well and progressivism in general because what he points out is that actually um, the machine was the, the, the promise of the machine was that it would like make things easier. It would it would lighten the load and that man would have more time over. This actually never happened. And what he says later is that um, instead of getting what you've got is lots of he uh, very few heads and lots of hands, you just need an ever greater supply of hands to run the machinery 
because you 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 are kind of we are Faustians unbound. There's no limit on it. There's never going to be enough production, which he'll he'll come back to at the very end of the book. Yeah, funny enough, that's exactly the first passage that I marked here. That's the one I I was like, I, I'm going to read this. This is a great passage. And then you had the exact same one. So that's uh, that's kind of funny. But yeah, that's a, a thing that really grabbed me uh, in the book is that he really talks about the need to uh, the maintenance of these systems, not just the machines themselves, though that is, of course, a big part of it, but the social abstractions, how each one of these things that was supposed to better our existence and reduce our labor and otherwise kind of re remove us from the human condition actually demands increasingly more and more of our time until we warp our society and our existence and kind of our understanding of what was the metaphysical around the maintenance of these completely artificial and separate things that no longer really tie us to humanity, the land, kind of the natural existence that we otherwise would value. Yes, and this, this, so this is the technique. This mm. is um, so the, the 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 man, the man of of techniques. This is to him in the same way that the lion uh, adopts the nature, uh, and it, it gets worse. I mean, just on a <laughs> just on a Spengler, song, yeah, <laughs> the, yeah. Like this is everybody knows that Spengler. Like reading Spengler is not a happy time, but he. One of the things that this leads to. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. But one of the problems with the, the kind of the utilitarian frame, which he emphasizes again and again and again in Man and Technics, which is because you can see that that's where it's just efficiency. And you end up with a situation where um, we, we begin to think like machines. We begin to behave like machines. And the great arc here is, is that in, in, in it, you we've become enslaved uh, to the machine in more ways than, um, well, I need the, the microwave to cook my tea or I need the car to take me there. It's actually deeper than that because we think like machines. We, we think in just in terms of raw efficiency, which is why he says here, um, of the soul, not one word was discussed, meaning to get back to the, the, the difference between the man of vision, the man of the eye, and the man of the, the hand, the man of the, the, the spiritual man, is now gone from the equation here so you've you're just left with with the techniques well and you you were also relaying to me one of your because i've seen this video the one you were talking about the the rhine and how people weren't able to understand it as something essential to kind of the spirit of the german people but instead is simply something to to serve a commercial purpose and the only sad part about its passing would be that you could no longer you use it as a unit of you know economic distribution yeah um there was a an article in a, that i did uh on a video maybe um in in this the summer when you you they had these stones um, in Germany and the the water of the Rhine had dropped to historically low levels. Um, by I, I think Spengler would have no problem like siding with the climate change like as a, as a cause of that. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to get into that on the article. I was like, yeah, I'm not. It, it could be. I'm I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, but he would probably say, yeah, it is. This is it. <laughs> you brought this on yourselves. What he would disagree with would be the solutions, which are actually like the full hell uh, of what his predictions right. would, would be. But um, so what amazed me was that we have the River Rhine, it's historically low, and there were these pebbles, and it would be say something like Hans, uh, sort of 1952, and it would mean the last time this big rock. Uh, had been exposed because the tide was so low, the, the the locals went down and painted their names on it. And one of them um, said, if you see me, then cry. Meaning that if if the water, if the water goes this low, famine is coming, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the newspaper articles, uh, which, which were describing this, were kind of like, the 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 right the, the river rhine is drying up and this could be bad for german germany economy and then you dug into it and it was like well the germans use the barges they use the rhine as a transportation hub for cement and tar and 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 heavy goods and scrap metal 
And I thought, this is the River Rhine that we're talking about. Like, this is this is like a spiritual point. It's really important. This is the reign of the rain maidens. It's the reign of romantic paintings. It, 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 it's like deeply and profoundly connected to the German Germanic identity, but I would say European identity uh, in, in general. And here we are, like this, this is a massive, massive deal. And yet when you're, when we're looking at the rain is drying up, it's like, oh, this is, we can't transport cement. Is it, is this, so what you've done is utterly, uh, as Max Weber would say, disenchant the world. I think you can actually go through uh, various stages of that happening as well, where, um, we're at the stage now where it, it only exists in a, in a utilitarian form. It only exists. The rain itself has been enslaved, as, as Spengler will points out in Marlin Technics. Um, all of nature will just be enslaved. It's it's interesting because we mentioned before we went live the C.S. Lewis connection to all of this. He even mm. mentions a, a waterfall, and the same applies here again. You know, like in Abolition of Man, when the boy ap applies a, a value uh, on on, uh, on a waterfall, on a on a spring or a fountain, and he says it's beautiful, and it's like, well, no, that it, it is just it is just water falling off a rock, or in the case of the rain, it is actually just handy to transport cement and what you've done is strip all metaphysical meaning uh, you've just gutted it um and it's a, a terrific thing i mean back to man and technics martin heidegger was actually really affected by this short book and he would go on to address some of these questions like at much much greater length and complexity um but he, uh, on the subject of the River Rhine, he was heartbroken because I think it was in the 1950s, they they dammed up the River Rhine. They turned it into this giant hydroelectric sort of energy supply. So Heidegger's point is the same as Spengler's um, and C.S. Lewis's again, where it's like, well, you you've changed what the rain is then because it is no longer some mystical thing it is no longer this special spiritual thing it's 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 now just what heidegger would say a standing reserve it is now just a quantity of water which will produce x amount of uh, kilowatts in in for power stations um and this this is this is the essence of man and technics it's this tragedy and what's, I mean, you know, when you read this as well, it is, um, Spengler's very heavily influenced by Goethe, and you get into the, the sort of Faustian myth. There's more to it than just this kind of obsessive drive to go into, like, empty spaces, uh, because you've got the tragedy to it as well, which a lot of people don't like. A lot of people, I mean, I, I get comments from from people um, in the in the in the scene and they they really don't like that it's essentially it's negative um you know we sh which like it, we should be positive about uh, european people and history and everything and this is a profoundly negative uh, vision which spengler paints here but he's not interested in that for him it's more like a grand drama or tragedy playing out and he writes it that way as well now, this destruction of the metaphysical through the mastery of, you know, these things that used to be essential to the land and the life of the people, um, is that because uh, I feel like he says that's part of a civilizational cycle for all civilizations, right? Like once the you've, you've got the age of cities and you know, all your institutions have, you know, kind of become sclerotic and, and every all the all the institutions are now standing in for the metaphysical signs, but they're only shadows of kind of what was there before. Is this, is this mastery and this hollowing out of metaphysics particular to Faustian man, or is, is that experience separate for them? What would he say to that? Do you think? Well, it, it happens on all civilizations, but the difference mm. with Faustian civilization is, is the aspect of seemingly being at war with nature. 
mm-hmm. um, which 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 isn't isn't really. I mean, people could dispute this. Uh, to be fair, um, I think there was some real issues with the the, the Mayan civilization in South America, but by and large, they didn't destroy the world in the in the sort of the epoch of their civilization. Um, because people will say, like, we can't actually the 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 cycle of civilizations. It can't happen to us because you know we've got like standing reserves of nuclear weapons. We've got nuclear power stations. Like, what's going to happen to all of that stuff uh, if if like all the lights go off and there's nobody there to man them anymore? Or well, yeah, that's that's a question, isn't it? Right. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Maybe somebody should be thinking about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, it's and in general, if you if you think of um, the other civilizations, if you take the Greeks for example, they they would of course harvest fish. They would of course uh, grow things, and um, they, they they would be in in a way exploiting nature. What's different about the the, the Faustian man is that he's taking like the very elementals of nature and turning it into energy. Um, like really, if you think of the coal, just haul, which he talks about quite a bit in Man and Technics, like the 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 coal, the the sort of the fuel buried deep within the 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 bosom of the earth, and and he, he paints these pictures where the earth's just being like torn open and violated to bring out all of this, all of her secrets will just be. It's almost like she's being raped. It's almost like Mother Earth is being raped by Faustian Man. Uh, or like even the the nuclear power, the idea of splitting the atom, you know, which isn't even to touch on the the sort of the transhuman things and uh, the genomes and everything which is coming down the line. It's it's more like there's nothing sacred about it, and it, this is why people have a problem because it does paint quite a it is quite a damning assessment of of Western civilization, which is being laid out here it's, it's it's there's a sort of touch of postmodernism about spangler as well which kind of upends your world view but he's he would as he would say it's more of a value neutral um he's more objective he's looking at things as they are i, I just I, I, like just standing back and thinking of it as this grand saga which is playing out yeah, he's not really uh, advocating for a particular culture or lifestyle or program or any of these things uh, in general. At least not in, in in the most for the most part. For the most part, he's in this kind of assessment mode, which drives a lot of people crazy. Everyone wants answers. Everyone wants solutions. Everyone wants advocations of programs and, and actionable items. But that's not really what Spangler is about. He's about trying to better understand this. And for Spangler, I think a lot of this is inevitable, right? He's a, he's a man who believes deeply in destiny. He talks about kind of the deep uh, the deep sense of of kind of cope. The idea of that that progress and and you know literature and, and and all these other things that we kind of wrap ourselves in to try to tell ourselves that we don't have to go through the cycle that we don't have to experience these things, uh, you know, it, it little maybe a little too deterministic for some people, even for myself, but uh, certainly something he is relentless about, right? He doesn't really, you know, this this book, as you pointed out, has the uh, the famous quote that optimism is for cowards, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's such a beauty that I think uh, if we um, I'll read through it. <laughs> we'll, sure. we'll do we'll do that the full we're full Give of justice. Me. Get your black pills ready, boys. Um, <laughs> strap in, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's strap in, strap in, and enjoy the ride. Um, <laughs> so, what's of course when you go back and you think of the the sort of the primitive, uh, well, I wouldn't say primitive, but the the early uh, Faustian man and the idea that his destiny unlike those of the other civilizations, it wasn't set. I mean, he points out that even um, even in the age of, of Christianity, um, God in, in Europe be, was not so much a king on a throne, which you would find in other civilizations, uh, very, very tangible, very sort of there in the moment. The, the God in Western civilization, he became like an infinite force, like it, it, ju- it just, it's like everything is is in this drive. Everything is about infinity and its force, 
and what he also uh, points up on, even going back to the early the early monks, Roger Bacon, and it's this idea of a machine of perpetual motion, which, which of course connects up to the infinity thing, where nothing would ever be settled, nothing would ever just be still. It was just this enormous drive, this push through uh, time, and to constantly be laying the tracks of civilization down. It like without end, with without end, and of the the reason why the the sort of the utilitarianism which he hammers in early on when you go back to the, the hand and the techniques which which it would kind of facilitate is is that when you keep going down that road and road again and again, you're going to end up in this place where the metaphysics gone, the religion's gone, spirituality's gone, all of this stuff has been left by the wayside in this drive towards efficiency, um, and all that you're left with is uh, being enslaved to the machine logic. Yeah, absolutely. There's so there, there's so much to to go over here, and we've only kind of got this this one show so far, as you pointed out when we were talking beforehand. You you could do a whole series on this, but I do want to get us to some of the um, the the last twenty pages or so. We've 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 touched into it a couple times, but it's rife with uh, predictions that uh, are, you know, manifest themselves on a pretty regular basis. And so it, it's kind of wild. There, there's a lot in there and a lot to unpack, but we'll do our best to kind of touch on, on the bright uh, points while we're here. So one of the things, because this is just something that I, I encounter so often uh, in so many of the things that I'm talking about is, is that he really points to the centralization, how these uh, techniques will eventually consume entire civilizations and that these, that basically you will have either these high civilizations that are able to produce these techniques and all the other, you know, kind of nations around the world will simply become the, uh, you know, subsidiaries of they'll simply become tools for harvesting the raw materials or processing the things that then feed the giant machine. And that's if that's not really a prediction of globalism, then I don't know what is. Yeah, and he also another great uh, Spenglerism is that he says that we've we've shifted from an organic society to an organized society, which mm. is a subtle, nice little play on words, but it, it says, as so, as so often the case, it really says a lot. The, the and, and the drive towards uniformity. When you go along to your job, you you well, in the jobs that I've had, you wear a uniform, <clears throat> meaning that you've become part of this collective block, which is centralized and which goes to serve the the, the, the state, the system, uh, just just the, the machine in general, and. An interesting thing that he points out, which I'd never picked up on before, I just reread it um, today and yesterday, <clears throat> is that when you've got this standardized collective block from the, the sort of the centralized system, you, it, it creates a sort of uh, backlash, which is specific to the Faustianism, where you, um, it, it, the, and, uh, Somebody will want to define their own individuality as against the kind of collective block. And I was reading it and I couldn't help but think of sort of the 1950s nuclear family. And then in the, the sort of the century of the self, the Adam Curtis documentary, the, what came in in the 60s, um, where, where you have like the societal norm which is almost like this perfectly ticking machine of capitalism, production, uh, and technolo technological advance. And it is uniform, and it is a sort of collective block. And that was actually the critique of uh, of some of the, the, the cultural Marxist types, Adorno and whatnot. And the, the, a lot of them were influenced by Spengler as well. Um, and what, what that led to is interesting because you can see that on the left, what would become the cultural left would be this idea that I will be I will have some kind of outlandish lifestyle or sexuality or whatever fashion statements um as a way to mark my individuality in opposition to the collective mass. But the the problem with that is that that was sort of uh that was kind of contained and created by the system itself. So right. today, today, you know, everybody, every, 
we've ended up in this weird situation today where you get uh, it's like the you get the new thing. What do they call it? Like the the current thing. I support the current thing, but everybody who supports the current thing thinks they are like individuals. Um, so many of the weird and wacky behavior of people on the left is in the in a it's 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 kind of tragic because they want to define their individuality against the norm, but the norm no longer exists. They are the norm. Um, yes. It's 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 as if we what so what we've created is the anti-civilization, and instead of having a like people would say, well, the, you know, the 1950s standard nuclear family, it was bull, it was boring, boring, and that itself was a creation of capitalism um, and the system. Which okay, that's fair enough, but all you've done, all we have now, is an inversion of that, and nobody is freer because of it. Um, at least on the old one, you could say it was healthy. You could say it still had some kind of, um, it 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 still had a, a kind of meaning to it, even if through nothing more than standard family, kids, um, an order in your life. And what they have done is create this sort of anti-civilization in the name of being in opposition to the collective, but falling straight into the next trap of the system. Well, and again, this is, you know, to, to kind of go with our theme of this running parallel to something like uh, abolition of man. This is what C.S. Lewis talks about, right? The once you have created a, a set of social engineers completely capable of separating man from his natural impulses, natural rhythms of life, uh, uh, unable to recognize kind of uh, where he came from, then you'll be able to, you know, the next generation won't be men truly anymore. They can't even recognize that they're no longer tied to these things because they've never known them in the first place. And it's interesting that so much of this, came together that, that massification and social engineering this centralization creation of leviathan coincides so much with the you know the mastery of techniques and then also the social engineering all of these things uh you know move simultaneously they interact they're require each one requires the other to operate properly it's uh, it's a little little eerie a little terrifying when you kind of think about it yeah yeah, it is. I thought um, the the part that I was I was gonna read out because I don't know how long we've got. Is, yeah, yeah, go for it. Is, there's some spicy things. In, there's actually some spicy things which Susan would not be happy about in this book. Oh, okay. So we, right. We've got to be careful with that. Gotcha. Um, but he he does he does make the point of the the sort of the 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 way that we the West just gave away its toys and its trinkets to the to everybody else in the world, and one one kind of prediction is that eventually. All of these, all of these toys, all of these machines and technologies will be turned on Faustian man um, himself, and, and, and it's it's kind of like yeah, well, that he comes to the end, and it's like that's not quite bleak enough. Uh, and then he, yeah, I'll skip that because Susan wouldn't like it. But he says this machine technology will end with the Faustian civilization, and will one day lie shattered and forgotten. Railways and steamships, as good as the old. Uh, Roman roads and the Chinese wall, our giant cities with their skyscrapers, just like the old palaces of Memphis and Babylon. The history of this technology is fast approaching its inevitable end. It will be eaten up from within, like all great forms of any culture. When and in what fashion, we know not. Fa faced with this destiny, there is only one worldview that is worthy of us. The aforementioned one of Achilles, Better a short life full of deeds and glory than a long and empty one. The danger is so great for every individual, every class, every people, that it is pathetic to delude oneself. Time cannot be stopped. There is absolutely no way back, no wise renunciation to be made. Only dreamers believe in ways out. Optimism is cowardice. We are born in this time and must bravely follow the path to the destined end. There is no other way. Our duty is to hold on to the lost position without hope, without rescue. To hold on like that Roman soldier whose bones were found in front of a adorned Pompeii who died because they forgot to relieve him when Vesuvius erupted. This is greatness. This is to have race. The honourable end is the one thing that cannot be taken from man. So... 
He really sugarcoats it. Yeah. Yeah, he really, <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he really lightens you up, doesn't he? Really, put, really lightens up your day. Yeah, it is quite the wordsmith, though. Yeah, it's it's interesting because, you know, I always every time I think about this aspect of Spangler, I always my mind always goes to Nick Land, who also talked a lot about you know the basically technics and 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 to the point where they basically escape humanity and and do their own thing like base basically uh you know and and land can be a little you know unclear so maybe, maybe i'm missing part of it but for but for him it almost seems like you know what what some would call capital might be these faustian technics and for him he almost thinks that they'll become self-sustaining that at some point like what do you think about that possibility that AI might be the continuation of Faustian techniques beyond the ability of Faustian man, Faustian man to sustain them? It's it's absolutely possible. Um, uh, that is possible, and and it would be it would kind of be the ultimate sort of crescendo to end it all. As will, of course, the the sort of transhumanism. Um, and the the there's so much of it coming now, where because you return to the theme of in, of infinite space. I mean, I I, I wrote um, an article some time ago where this this idea where you have these vast sort of warehouses where like hundreds of thousands or millions of people are literally living in the matrix uh, in in these little kind of bug bath things where they're being fed nutrients but their consciousness is kind of floating around in cyberspace so it would be almost like the, the sort of the, the ultimate sort of faustian end is just to disappear into the infinite space created by your own techniques um a while outside you've got people with goats those who escaped uh because this this sounds kind of crazy and exaggerated but it, it is actually how the civilizations tend to go because you always do have the friction between the metropolis and the the man of the the, the peasant. So for Spengler, the 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 sort of the man of the land, the peasantry are to forever tormented by the the intellect of the city, which imposes itself on him. But he's always resistant to it, and and Spengler says eventually he'll go. That is the people who go back to the land, like mm -hmm. he calls them plants, as if they've just planted themselves back into the the landscape. And then the metropolis is is actually where where it, it falls into decay. And it, it it's it's crazy because we see this now. And for the for the progressive worldview, this this uh, we touched on it at the beginning. This raises real deep existential problems. Because if you are kind of doomers like us, um, and you you kind of you're on the Spangler train, or even if you're just kind of interested in in his ideas of a cyclical version of history, this is going to create an existential problem with the progressive mind, um, because there's going to come a point when you you are absolutely in decline and you can no longer deal with it, and they are going to and I, I keep using the phrase like but. It, it's as if they are going to be dragged kicking and screaming on the downward spiral because their their worldview can't have that. It can't have uh, a reduction even in material living standards. I mean, they've already accepted that there's no religion, there's no actual uh, deep meaning, or there's no sort of exploration of the human condition. They've done away with all of that. Um, and then they, it, it's become... Well, it's a lot of incoherent mumbo jumbo, um, and a lot of it transcending the self, uh, the, the you know the trans issue and stuff. Um, but even just in the old-fashioned standard material argument, which is what they'll inevitably fall back on in the end, is that look at the end of the day, okay, things aren't great anymore, but materially you're better off than than say the the people at Spengler's peak would be the middle ages um that that's was that was his sort of ideal time because you had the balance between the man of of spirituality and the man of the hand just right so if you think of Notre Dame cathedral for example here you had the man of the vision the man of the the truth and he was instructing 
the, the the man of the technics on what he wanted to see built, and then it was the man of the hand who would build it. So then you have everything in sync, everything aligned. Eventually, it's the hand, the technics slip away, slip out of control. But the left have only really exist uh, in the utilitarian frame, which is why they tend to, which is why it's more of a thing after the industrial revolution, really, because it's about all of these material conditions. And I fear that um, as things decline, they're going to face an existential problem, and because it'll eventually be unmistakable, and they're going to res they're going to resort to ever more extreme and barbaric methods to book his destiny to stop destiny coming. Um, it will be this extreme panic when anything is justified. And in actual fact, I mean, it's a cringe uh, sort of term that gets thrown around these days. But when you have a look at the the sort of the Great Reset, the 2030 agenda, all of this, what we literally call um, technocrats, um, that that is that in a way. It is that they see all of these problems coming uh, in the in the distant horizon and it's like well okay we need this complete restructuring of how we live because we can't we can't have it i mean we can't have it where we just break apart globalism and live more basic lives uh, localism basically uh, mm -hmm. that that never seems to be an option everything always has to be centralized and uh, and planned at this gigantic sort of technocratic level this utilitarian frame once again the ultimate being of course that they're going to save the world from the from climate change it's like it's like the ultimate it's where it goes and in the process they like, create one giant prison camp where everything is controlled through technology and digital technology and it, at a certain level i think that is about uh, being in denial of some fundamentals, not realizing that we strayed way, way off the path uh, of what is no uh, the norm of the human condition a long time ago, uh, and instead of saying, "Okay, let's get, let's just take a breather, let's slow this down, let's slow this down and see where are we going as a civilization," maybe we need to ch fundamentally change things. Maybe we need to. Uh, so let's get rid of some of this technology. Do we really need all of it? What about like doing things at the local level? Uh, what about what about the idea of just having fulfilling lives and it, where it doesn't feel like we're on this speeding train all of the time? But and, and that's it, it, that's not, that's not what they want because they they are insistent that the future is open ended. Still, this the where the, the destiny hasn't been set. Um, but we're reaching the limits of it. We're reaching the point where actually, the the the, the as in Faust, as in Goethe's Faust, um, the, the 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 devil wants his Jew. Well, and the you know the inversion of natural hierarchies is the key to their power. It's the it's what they've built their coalition on. They can't go back. I mean, and, and in many ways, that's what creates this and, and forms this into a self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, I was just talking uh, uh, with uh, someone who wrote an interesting columnist on column on kind of the Elon Musk situation yesterday, but she pointed out that like, think of the massive percentage of the economy right now, which is dedicated to basically lying about reality and 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 creating this scaffolding to hold up this this lie that everyone has to walk around and pretend this denial of of reality think of how much of our actual production and output and even the utility that should be producing the abundance that they would otherwise promise is now dedicated entirely to non-production simp simply generating compliance with a narrative that's that's a complete lie about reality and so in many ways they they even though this is a runaway train that will doom their kind of political formula they can't walk away because it is the very thing on which their power and their their kind of belief system is built yeah, it's almost it's almost like Roger Bacon's sort of self perpetuating machine, like the, yeah. the, 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 <laughs> the machine that just can't stop. It just perpetuates yeah. itself, even if it's just nonsense and lies. I mean, the, the funny thing about um, Elon Musk, it was interesting because the last time we did a Spengler stream, this is way before um, Elon Musk was was going to buy Twitter or anything, and we were speculating on sort of Caesar I Caesar mm -hmm. types emerging in the West. And he popped up as a bit of a wild card. 
not so much because we're Elon Musk fans, but just because if you've got your hands on this technology and if you've got this amount of uh, power, uh, you you can do things with that. There's there's potential there, regard no matter who it is, you know. Uh, not not I'm not to sim for Elon Musk, but as a as a type of uh, where his standing. Um, so he that that's interesting, and I did I did an article uh, and a video about it was called like why Elon Musk won't travel to Mars, um, uh, but how he could, and the the idea of it, it was a sort of Spengler inspired uh, video and, and uh, essay that I'd written was precisely because if you go back a little bit, um, which is a typical sort of Faustian thing would be the question of why do you climb the mountain, which is the question, I think it was Edmund Hillary was asked that, like, why do you want to climb Mount Everest? And he said, because it's there. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's, but there's no, um, that there's no rational sort of reason to climb the mountain, to risk your life to climb a mountain, which at that time, many people that died uh, were dying on mountains. Many people from Germany and England and America were just freezing. Many men were just freezing to death on the side of mountains for no reason. For, for, and it was, it was, of course, we know why. It was because it had to be done. It was that insatiable drive towards the infinite. Um, but at the same time, the, the, the other side of that which is the, the the technics and the utilitarianism and the machine has squeezed out that wonder as well and turned people in, as, as Spengler points out in Marlon Technics. Uh, he, he comes out another great line is that he, he, he describes like a, 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 a swathe of land and like, you know, Scotland or, you know, the, the, the fjords of Norway. And it's like where once 100 men would roam now 10,000 people sit. And I thought yeah. that's <laughs> that's exactly it. It's just great. Yeah. Um, and so what's happened is the 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 the, ten, the hundred people who like to roam uh, are now sort of being cajoled and cattle prodded to become part of the 10,000 who sit. So if you are going to have a typically sort of Faustian vision of traveling to Mars. By the time Elon Musk, I mean, I, I, I painted a picture of Elon Musk at like 75 years old. He's finally got the rockets. They're pointing straight upwards. Um, they're ready to go. This is it. That, but nobody wants to go on them. And anyway, you can just go on. You can just put on your virtual reality headset and see Mars in the bugman way, in the utilitarian way. So we, we have a thing. We have a sort of there's almost like a civil war in the Western soul itself here. Yeah. And it's the, the utilitarian bug man who is for now uh, dominating, but I don't think, I don't know how long that can possibly go on for because what's emerging from it is something hellish. And the point that I made in a sort of open uh, address to Elon Musk was like, if you want to rekindle the spirit uh, where people would actually get excited to go to Mars, knowing they'd probably never come back, then it's you, you can't do it by also designing virtual reality headsets where people can see it sitting on their armchairs. Mm -hmm. There's there's a there's a fundamental problem here. There's a there's a fundamental paradox which needs to be resolved. Yeah, no, I think that's that's right. It, there's so much of that right now, and COVID only accelerated that. There are so many experiences that were fundamental. You had to go do things physically. You had to interact with people face to face, and now so much of it is, you know, some simulacrum of, simulacrum of it is available. And this is true in so many areas, right? Whether it's it's you know porn driving away people from dating, or whether it's uh, you know Skype allowing people or or whatever the Zoom the the you know the video conferencing allowing people they don't have to go to work anymore they don't have to go to school anymore uh, you know all this stuff is super convenient you know I I, I think about um, how much harder it was for people to go back to church after they could watch it online right like just the the battle of the future is the battle between simulacrum and reality people who are willing to force themselves to actually 
experience the thing in real life and 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 have the the true experience as opposed to those that can kind of be bottle fed this managed version of it that can be you know uh, intermediated through all these different devices and, and that goes i think hand in hand with where you you mentioned earlier talking about people thinking like machines right where the the real question of the future won't be can we make a mind that thinks like a human uh, an artificial mind that thinks like a human a computer thinks like a human the question will be will humans be able to avoid thinking like computers yes and you can see in the elites themselves um the humans and the arrogance is that they I, th I think a lot of political ideology has been built on top of that uh, sort of the 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 hand the techniques the utilitarianism has been with us for quite a long time now and there's there's a lot of ideology has been built on on top of that um without taking into consideration at all the the man of vision the man of, of philosophy um the man of truth that's gone so what we have is just this sort of house of cards of ideologies which have been erected on top of the thinking of technics um, and, and quite literally, the technocratic thinking that we, we see emerging today is, is that. And it, it, it's, it's the, the visions that we see are just um, absolutely ghastly and appalling because it, it all, it, it's like, it, 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 it's, it's just, it really is just the thinking of the machine. It, it you know you look at the way the, the the pandemic was handled you look at all of the new big problems that they've I mean this is another thing it's it's always a problem to be solved there's always a new but this time they're they're like on such vast scales and they do it with this such blase attitude that the 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 general public are just seen as ants um to to be shifted around and to be and even you know you can bring in the sort of issues with immigration and demographics none of this none of this is taken into account that this might mean something that this might matter to people is ever taken into consideration everything is just abstracted onto a spreadsheet and you just have to deal with it um i was i've been looking at ai art uh recently and sort of thinking that over um and i read an article on substack of somebody who didn't like it and he had this uh, painting of Rembrandt. I mentioned this again. I mentioned it recently somewhere else. And, and there was a man, and he obviously had a, like a, a really badly wounded arm in this painting of Rembrandt. Um, and then you had the person beside him, and the, the doctors and the people standing around him, they weren't actually looking at the injury in his arm in this painting. They were looking at a kind of schema of what a human arm looks like. When like the actual real one was like standing right, and I, I just, I just find that, I just, I just found that fascinating. What, what that mm -hmm. was saying. He was trying to make a wider point about AI art, but it also applies to where we, we no longer see the, the things in the real he, here and now, or what's right in front of you. What you have to do in the like common sense. No, everything has to be then to the expert i mean another another class that spengler has nothing but contempt for of course yeah yeah all right well we we've gotten to our hour here i, I think we we could go much longer but uh do try to keep these around there we have a few uh super chats here so um i'll get ready to grab those but I, i'm sure most people watching this know but can you tell people uh where to grab your stuff where they can listen to you read you do you have anything big coming up I've got um, Morgos Review on YouTube, Morgos Review on Substack, where most of my, my content is now. Um, I've got a, a video essay that I've been working on, which I put on the back burner uh, just for now, because uh, I've got a lot on, which is looking at that uh, the Disney thing and or which came out, because we've just had the Christmas holidays. And I thought, well, go on. That's the time that I kind of lounge around feeling a bit groggy and watch nerd content. And like, okay, what are nerd YouTube up to? What are they talking about? Mm. And um, everybody was talking about this Andor thing where basically it, it's Star Wars meets 1984. And I was enjoying some of the takes on that. And I thought it was it was fascinating. The way the way uh, left YouTube were were looking at that, thinking they were the rebels and not the empire. 
So yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in exploring that as a theme. And I've got quite a long script. So I think I'm going to do a good old fashioned video essay on that soon. Sounds promising. All right. We'll look forward to it. Uh, let's see. We got Narco Republican here for $5. Thank you very much, sir. Fact, a little known 1993 reprint of Man and Technique uh, includes a uh, an introduction by none other than Jonathan Bowden. It can be easily found on YouTube. I think I actually listened to that because it yeah. just kind of randomly popped into my feed. Yeah, I I, I, I came across that. Yeah, uh, I, uh, yeah. My the the man and techs are, techniques I've got is from Arctos, um, which is yeah, got, I've got the, this edition here. Yeah, that's the one I've got too. It's 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 nice. But yeah, Jonathan Bowden did. Uh, I think he was involved in some kind of publishing house back in the day, and mm -hmm. they they, you know, I mean, fair play. I think if it wasn't for some of these small, uh, dissident sort of publishing houses back in the day, some of this stuff might have been very hard to find these days. But our 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 friends are doing great work, uh, giving them new covers and bringing them back out again. No, there's, there's a, a, if there's one thing, you know, we always talk about like, what should the right build? What should, you know, what should people, you know, build in, in opposition? The one thing that, uh, you know, the, they have down is the, uh, the small independent publisher uh, that's, that's just doing the Lord's work, reprinting a lot of this stuff that otherwise would be incredibly obscure and difficult. To, I, to I, I would, I would I'd also advise like buying physical copies of all of these kinds yes. of books. Precisely because what we're talking about, um, you know, if everything is digital, everything's online, uh, it, it, be careful with that, as, as we've been discussing. But more than that, it is just, you know, you want to sit in your armchair and, like, you know, pour yourself a little whiskey and just open Spangler or Evola or Carlisle or whoever it happens to be. It's uh, it's the it's the real way to, the, the, like, there's a kind of grim irony to reading something like Marlin Technics, like on a digital screen. Yeah, um, yeah on a PDF, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's be, doff, doff your cap, lads, and buy their books and read them as they would want you to. Yeah, and I, and I like to listen to a lot of books, and there's a lot of stuff that I like. I listened to the entire open letter from Moldbug, like, you know, like uh, I, I never read it. Uh, it. There was no physical copy, but I never read it in the blog form originally. Uh, but there are when I get to stuff like Carlisle, it's just not an option. I have to stop. I have to sit down. I have to give it my full attention. There's just no other way to do it. Uh, let's see. Narco Republican again here for another five dollars. Thank you very much. Another black pill exploration of uh, techniques is given in. Uh, he's got the German there, but English is uh, the failure of technology by Friedrich George Junger. Have you ever heard of that book? No, I've heard of Junger, but I don't know this work. Yeah, there's, I feel like I've heard that name before, but there's, there's. I mean, we were discussing a little bit uh, before we went live that around this time you have uh, what like a huge amount of of literature and books come out after World War One, um, mainly mainly on the right of of a lot of people saying, wait, wait a minute, like they have just seen the meat grinder of World War One, and they're like, this really matters. Like, what happened there? Like we've just seen European man like feed himself into the, the the machine guns, into the machine that he created. This is an existential problem for the civilization, and we need to take stock of it. And then they thought through more fundamentally, as we just discussed with man and techniques, what had gone wrong here, not just in terms of policies, of governments, or issues with central banks, something much more fundamental. And you, especially in the Germans, again, we've got uh, Junger there. The Germans in particular seem to have cottoned on that the, I mean, Spengler does it again. Yeah, the utilitarianism is always blamed on the Anglos, basically, and mm -hmm. probably rightly so. Um, but And the Germans throughout the 19th century, they, they didn't like this. They seemed to be onto this. Um, they wanted to have that enchanted world. They didn't like just production and and sort of spreadsheets and the shopkeeper mentality of the English. And you can see it in those picturesque sort of castles and uh, the, the trad posters post all of the time. They were trying to retain and hold on to a more mystical, um, special world, which, I mean, you, you know, you talk about black pills, which eventually... Um, the tension there was going to blow apart uh, 
it's particularly Europe, but I would say Western civilization in general, that, like that that friction, that tension at a deeper level beyond just policies uh, was was going to have to come out and be uh, ended one way or another. And unfortunately, it had happened the worst possible way you can imagine. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, alternative avenues here for four ninety nine. Europeans on theories of supernatural forces directing tech advances. Example: portals at, uh, at CERN, reverse engineering from ET ships, demons in AR art, etc. What do you think, uh, Morgoth? Supernatural uh, manifestations directing uh, technological advances. Your theories on your opinions on theories of supernatural forces directing tech advances. Actually, portals at CERN, reverse engineering from. Um, I, I do. I'm, it's tempting to sort of say no, but I, I, you've got to be careful. I'm, I'm, I'm secretly interested in these things, but you've got to be careful. I've got to be careful what I say because, like, you open yourself up to all. Oh, Morgoth believes in demons, or and all of this kind of thing. But it, it, there's certain things, especially with AI art, um, that I, that I've noticed, which is which is kind of spooky, which is kind of weird. Um, the portals at CERN are also, I know a little bit about that. I don't know so much about reverse engineering from ET ships. One of the things I find interesting about the AI art, and I've, I've, I've made hundreds of images. Um, I'm quite, I've become qu quite good at it. I've, I've made some nice things. I never understand why all of the people, um, all, all kind of, if you, if you create like a scene, like a landscape, uh, of one kind or another, and you put people in it, they're always got their backs to the, the us, and they're always staring off into the horizon. And I don't understand why that is. Maybe it's just easier because they're dodging. The, the AI is dodging having to create faces or something. Um, it could be that. you know. It, again, they, even the AI, we're talking about the techniques, just the efficiency, that is also inherent even within the AI art. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my I, I would I don't know about any of these specific examples, but I would say that the the function of kind of uh, deterritorializing a lot of stuff out of the sacred and into kind of the purely material and marketplace, the the purely quantifiable, has allowed and facilitated all kinds of evil. A lot of things that would have been very obviously horrific um, become less so when they can be quantified and pulled apart and uh, made into cold systems. And so in that way, I think the, the it is there probably is something to supernatural, you know, the, the, the fact that the metaphysical is stripped out, allowing even more evil to enter the world probably does have some, some tie there though. I don't think it's directly maybe to any it's, one of these particular references to, to events with, with any particular technology. It's, it's interesting because you can also see the symmetry with, um, you know, we, we Faust is obviously connected with the devil. That's the right. symbolism there. But then you also in um, John Milton's paradise lost, and the, the the arc of Satan. Remember, Satan, where he gets he wages war in um, in heaven and in Paradise Lost, and God kicks him out. But what what's interesting about that is that Satan is a man of the Enlightenment. He he yeah. he's what's so controversial about Paradise Lost is that he's a very clever, very witty. Uh, sort of a charismatic guy. He isn't the sort of lisping, demonic, slithering thing at all. Uh, and what happens is that the further away, it, it's like the, the the rationalism sort of decomposes the further away he moves from God. Um, because the more, it, it's kind of like what Carl Schmitt says about liberalism being self-contained. He doesn't have an outside reference anymore other than him himself and his own rationality. So he ends up kind of going mad. And it's it's when, it, in, say, in, in a civilization like ours, which prides itself on its rationality, you begin to see this arc where, you know, in the name of well, we will we will figure this out on reason alone, and you begin suddenly it emerges like that you're heading into like a literal hell, like it it, it sort of comes back in a full arc, and that's what a lot of people I think 
you you see this more and more now where it used to be you'd say people would say all oh, the lefties are crazy now they call them demonic now mm -hmm. now it's like it's beyond this this isn't this is this is something else this is there has to be a, a, a frame of reference for this. Like, how did we end up when you see some of these things uh, happening, coming from on high and on the sort of rank and file sort of orcs of the system? You begin to think, hang on a minute, this isn't. This is there's something fundamentally evil here. I can I cannot explain it in any other way. Yeah, I, I also think about you know well we can go ahead and land this uh, with a with a nerdy Warhammer 40k reference since we're both fans here. I also think about how you know in that lore the you know the emperor is supposed to be this grand atheist man of science you know and he's gonna bring civilization together and hold back you know but but the only thing that actually ends up kind of holding back the the little like hosts of hell that are supposed to you know come out of this are basically the religious faith that ends up you know, assembling around him after, you know, his, uh, his demise. Um, so just kind of the, the, the things that end up battling this at the end of the day, aren't the cold science and reason, but actually the return uh, to, to the religious sense in a, in a very real way, something yeah, that, that the, per the person being worshiped would have despised. Yeah. The, 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 the sort of the enlightenment, the, the rationale, that was all just a big contract. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here, but this has been a great stream. I always have an amazing time talking with Morgoth, especially about Oswald Spangler. So this, this is always a lot of fun. I was definitely looking forward to this. I know a lot of you guys were too. Make sure you're checking out all of Morgoth's stuff, uh, all the different places he talked uh, about, like the YouTube channel, the, uh, the sub stack and all of that. Also, if it's your first time here, please make sure you go ahead and sub sub uh, subscribe. And if you want to hear these, as just audio podcasts. Uh, remember that they are available on all your major podcast platforms now, so you can go ahead and uh, check that out. Make sure that you leave a rating and a uh, review if you do. That would be great. It really helps everything out. But uh, thank you, everyone, for coming on. And Morgoth, always great to talk to you, man. No problem. See you later, folks. All right, guys. We'll see you later. And always, as always, we'll talk to you next time. Excellent. Oh, that was that was a, a jam-packed meaty one.